Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, do we have an echo, or is that okay? You no, can hear me? Somebody watching uh, the talking on streaming uh, in the room. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so we don't get a... Whoops, shouldn't this work? Or is this not advancing? Advancing the slide. So just... Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to have a brief commercial break. So the advertising for an upcoming conference. Um, so since you're all at a mathematics uh, of modern cryptography conference, you should all be interested in the upcoming mathematics of cryptography conference at UC Irvine, which is going to take place very soon, August 31st through September 3rd. And the organizers, some of whom uh, you may know, some may actually be in this room. Um, and that, in fact, is approximately where it's going to be. And this is a photograph that was actually taken by participants of a similar workshop, a similar conference two years ago, a conference called, in fact, Lattices with Symmetry. And uh, what we actually saw was a blue whale, which is the largest mammal on the planet. And we saw dolphins. These were uh, dancing under the bow of our boat. And uh, some of you can vouch uh, for the fact that I think we have a few people here who are actually on that boat and can vouch for the fact that we actually did see this from our boat. And we plan to have another excursion. Our excursion, we also expect to be a boat out in the ocean looking for whales and looking for dolphins. So I encourage anyone who's interested, come for the dolphins, stay for the mathematics. Um, OK, so let me first start with the punchline. We're going to be talking about lattices with symmetry. Um, so if you have large rank, it's difficult to decide whether your lattice has an orthonormal basis. Another way of saying that is it's difficult to decide whether the lattice is isomorphic to z to the n. But it's easier for lattices that have additional structure. So if you have lattices with enough symmetries, we, you can actually solve this problem. So that's what I, I think I said on the first slide. Everything I'm going to be saying is joint work with Hendrik Lenstra. And what we do is we give an algorithm that decides whether a given lattice with sufficiently many symmetries has an orthonormal basis. And if it does, then we give an algorithm for finding it. Um, and this is um, not only inspired by, but very much based on an algorithm that goes back a number of years that was due to Craig Gentry and Mike Zidlow. But what I'd like to do is to tell you a story, which is um, what, our motiv what our original motivation was and how we ended up um, coming up with this algorithm. So um, this is about four or five years ago, so just after the Smart for Cauterin work came about, Hendrik Lenstra went to a talk on it, I think given by Frey for Cauterin, um, which was about the, this paper that was mentioned in the last talk and some other talks on fully homomorphic encryption with relatively small key and ciphertext sizes. And Hendrik had some ideas related to that. And he and I started discussing them, and that's what eventually led to this work, but after some intermediate steps that I'd like to briefly tell you about. So you um, saw a little bit maybe in the last talk, but I'll briefly recall a version of, and everything I'm going to tell you is going to be oversimplified, but a version of the schemes of Smart for Katerin and Gentry Halevi. Um, so as we've been seeing in a number of talks, let's let capital N be a power of 2, and f of x is x to the n plus 1. And we're going to take the number field k, which is q square bracket x modulo f of x. So that's a cyclotomic field generated by primitive 2nth roots of unity, um, a primitive 2nth root of unity. And um, in order to set up the crypto system, we're going to take um, a polynomial v of x of degree n minus 1 with integer coefficients that are random t-bit integers for a suitably chosen parameter t. And we're going to take this matrix V where the first row is the coefficients of the polynomial. And then we're going to make this um, sort of an anti-circulant matrix from that. So we get an n by n matrix. And the rows are just the coefficients of x to the i times v, to the, v of x mod f of x, where i is running from 0 to n minus 1. And the lattice that we consider, the lattice L, is the lattice in z to the n generated by the rows of v. And we're going to let little d be either you can take it as the determinant of the matrix or equivalently the determinant of the lattice. And if d were not, is not odd and square free, you try again with a new v of x. 
Um, and you don't really need to know what's going on here, but as in the last talk, the bad basis, the public basis, uh, or the public uh, matrix is going to be B, which you can just take to be the Hermite normal form of the matrix V. The fact that we chose little d to be odd and square free tells us that this matrix constructed in this way that you don't have to know is in fact the Hermite normal form of V. So we have an n by n matrix V, um, which is coming from some randomly chosen polynomial, and we take the Hermite normal form that gives us our um, matrix B. So our public key um, is B, our secret key is V, so the rows of V are giving us our lattice L, and those rows are giving us a good basis for the lattice, and that's our secret key. And the rows of B are giving us a different basis for the lattice, and that's our bad basis, um, and that's our public key. So in, the, um, in some of these schemes, you want to encrypt a bit. So suppose B is your bit. You choose a random noise polynomial. So that's U of X, which um, let's take the coefficients to be um, from the set 0, plus or minus 1, where they take the values 1 and minus 1 with equal probability. So this is your noise polynomial. And you're going to take the bit, and you're going to add it to twice the noise polynomial. And then you're going to take the coefficients of that, and that gives you a vector. So a vector in, in R to the N. And the cipher text, so this you can think of as how you're encoding your plain text. So this is your plain text message point um, in Euclidean space. And what the cipher text is, well, there's, you could write down a formula for it, but basically what you do is you take this plain text point and you translate it to the fundamental parallelopiped corresponding to the public bad basis for your lattice. So let me give you, I'll give you a picture of that in a slide very soon, um, but let me just point out, so decryption, you take your ciphertext and you translate it back, which means mean, going to mean you translate it to the fundamental parallelopiped corresponding to your secret key, which is your good basis for the lattice. So let me draw a picture. So you do that, you get um, your plain text point, you look at the first coordinate, you take it mod 2, and that's going to give you your bit. So just to give you a picture, um, so here, since I can only draw things in two dimensions. We have a two-dimensional lattice, so the black points are your lattice. Um, you can, let's um, take as generators, our bad generators are going to be this point and this point. So you get a parallelogram that they generate, that they span, and we're going to translate that so that it's centered at the origin, just, for, for some, just to make things nice. So this is the fundamental region translated to the origin, centered about the origin. This green point is going to be your plain text point. So that was that, that A that I had on an earlier slide. And so if you want to um, find the cipher text, what you do is you move it into the fundamental region, to the fundamental parallelogram. So in other words, you find a lattice point where you can add that lattice point to the cipher, to the plain text point in order to put you into the fundamental region. So there's a unique way to do that. There's a unique lattice point that you can add. And there's a unique point in the fundamental region that you can translate it to. So that red point is the cipher text point. And if you want to go back, what you do is you take that red point, your cipher text, and you translate it into the fundamental parallelogram associated with the good basis. And the good basis is hopefully more orthogonal. And um, hopefully this works and you can translate it back. Um, so what their so their secret bases remember the consists of the rows of a matrix where the first row is chosen basically at random. Um, the more randomly it's chosen, the higher the security. But what Hendrick noticed and what he pointed out to them was that the less likely that one can actually decrypt. So decryption will fail if your plain text point does not lie in the fundamental parallel pipe, but corresponding to the to the good. Matrix. So he pointed out that actually decryption had a problem in the original smart for Catherine scheme, um, and that was an issue. And that's what actually led to our working together on this. So one way to try to deal with that, so in order to try to make decryption more feasible, rather than taking the coefficients of your polynomial V to be random t-bit integers, um, so in Conver as I guess. Um, Craig for Catherin told Hendrick, and in conversations between Craig and myself, um, they both suggested taking um, the constant term v0 to be roughly 2 to the t, and taking the remaining vi's very small compared to 2 to the t, so that um, these coefficients, you know, this coefficient vector looks roughly like this. Um, and then the resulting basis is then orthogonal enough to allow efficient decryption. 
Um, but then the question is, is this secure? Does this impinge on the security? Um, so Hendrik and I started analyzing that, and so we um, analyzed it from the following point of view, which is that, so you take, let V be, um, take your polynomial V evaluated at primitive 2n through root of unity. Well, remember that the only, there's this dominant um, constant term and everything else is negligible, so it's approximately the same as the constant term V0. Our lattice was defined to be, well, so you can think of it as the principal ideal generated by this this um, element V, um, sitting inside, remember our number field K, our cyclotomic field, um, take K tends to the real numbers, so that's complex numbers to the n over 2, view that as being R to the n, so this is Euclidean space, we have a lattice now L embedded in Euclidean space R to the n, and our D, which was the determinant of the lattice, has the property that D to the 1 over n is approximately the absolute value of this constant term. So now if we look in, so in K tensor R, our ambient space, we can look at, well, 1 is just an element of our field. 1 tensor D to the 1 over N, view that as an element of our R to the N. Um, what we're saying here is that this element, this alpha, is very close to V, and V is a lattice point. So an alpha is basically public. Um, D is public, um, N is public, so this is, this is a public public information, um, and if you want to recover the secret V, what you can do is try to find the closest lattice vector to alpha, and that's going to be V. So, and we, um, Hendrik noticed that if V1, or we notice, I guess, that, that if um, V1 up to Vn minus 1 are too small, then the closest lattice vector um, to alpha is much closer than the next closest lattice vector, and what we know from LLL is that then the LLL algorithm will find it. So that was an issue in terms of, of using that um, that modification in terms of the security. Um, so at that point, we started modifying the um, smart Fricaterin scheme um, using for the secret key a lattice basis that, was, that we called nearly orthogonal. So it was orthogonal enough to make decryption feasible while we tried to make it random enough to still be secure. Um, and we had this very nice system that used some nice mathematics, and it uses a renormalization of Gauss's measure, and it had all sorts of um, nice features, except that at some point I gave a talk about it, and um, Daniela, after the talk, um, told me, well, he was worried that it imposed, that what we had done imposed too much structure. And he suggested that we go back to the gentry Zidlow paper and have a look at an algorithm in that paper to see if it gives an attack on what we were proposing. And that turned out to be an excellent idea and led to much more interesting things than what we had been doing before that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so what's the paper of Gentry and Zidlow that he sent us back to? Um, so it was called Cryptanalysis of the Revised n -true Signature Scheme. It was um, in Eurocrypt 2002. And um, so I started looking through the paper, and I showed it to Hendrik and said, Hendrik, look at this paper. There's some interesting things here. And he said, oh, this is just cryptography, and it's... Uh, it was a hard to read paper, but he said, no, Hendrik, this is okay, look at this. And at some point he looked at it and he said, hey, wait a second, there are things in here about lattices that I don't know, and that, I, that, that Hendrik didn't know how to prove. And there were some genuinely new ideas that he found very impressive. So when, when Hendrik Lenstra um, sees something new about lattices, um, that's, that's time, I think, to stop and take note. Um, so um, here's a picture that was um, around, taken by me around the time that uh, Gendry and Zidlow came up with their algorithm. This was AsiaCrypt. 2001 on the Gold Coast of Australia. So I think they were not toasting the, uh, this was just the banquet at Asia Crypt. They were not toasting the uh, algorithm, but I think that's when they were doing the work. Who are they? Who are they? How many people recognize? So I'm the missing seat because I was taking the picture. Gentry, that there one, no? yeah. so Craig. Gentry, Craig is there. So Mike, Mike is Fong. here. Fong. Mike Zidlow is here. This is Fong. This is Stephen Galbraith. And this is, I guess, is Ben Lin, who, who did hierarchical identity based encryption and stuff like that. Yeah. What's that? Um, that it's an Asia Crip banquet and everyone was getting drunk and it was fun and it was nice being in Australia, especially after September 11th, which was right before that. And we were all finally away from, uh, we were having fun, we were having a good time. And they were doing the Gentry Zidlow algorithm, although the rest of us probably didn't know that. Okay, so what is the Gentry Zidlow algorithm? So I'm actually only looking at the part of the algorithm in, I think, section maybe seven of their paper. So they have a, an algorithm, and I'm only looking at a certain part of it. And the part that we care, that, that Hendrik and I care about was, and the part I care about for this talk, 
was what they do is they're looking at the ring z square bracket x mod x to the n minus 1. So that's something we've been seeing a bit here. Um, and what they have is a principal ideal in that ring. And the input to the algorithm is a z basis for the ideal and um, v, v bar, where v is promised to be a generator for that ideal. <coughs> and what the algorithm does is it recovers the generator or generator v for the principal ideal. So you have a promise that ideal is principal. You're given a z basis for it. Um, you're given v, v bar, and you want to output v. So here, n is an odd prime. And what do I mean by, by v bar? Well, so if v is this polynomial. Um, v bar is what's called its reversal. So you keep the constant term the same, and you reverse the other coefficients. And it's called bar because if you view this as being sitting inside a product of cyclotomic fields, it really is just complex conjugation in that case. Um, so you want to think maybe of v, v bar as the crucial hint that is giving you enough structure or enough symmetry in order to recover v. Is this v, v bar the gram matrix of the basis? Right, it corresponds to the gram matrix of the, of the basis. That's right. Um, so very, very roughly, and again, I'm vastly oversimplifying, um, the, their method was to um, very briefly choose auxiliary very large primes, p and p prime, that have the property that the GCD, the greatest common divisor of p minus 1 and p prime minus 1 is 2n. So remember, we were looking at z square bracket x mod x to the n minus 1. It's the same n. Then they use certain somewhat mysterious looking polynomial chains and the LLL algorithm to compute v to the p minus 1 and v to the p prime minus 1 modulo other auxiliary primes without actually knowing v yet. And then they use the Euclidean algorithm and the statement that they know about the GCDs in order to take these two things, modulo certain things, and compute v to the 2n. And from that, they were able to extract a 2nth root to recover v. So roughly, that's what they were doing. Um, <laughs> step two the I will say a little bit more about step two in a later slide. Um, but, so this is the rough algorithm. I didn't understand anything. Right. OK. So then there's the fact that, that um, yeah, so there's the question of what is, what is going on here. Um, <laughs> and that was, that, was, that was partly our question, is what is going on here? Because the gentry of the paper, in fact, you can follow the algorithm and see what it does. But the question of why they did this and why it works was kind of our question. It was something of a mystery. And I think to most people reading that paper, it was something of a mystery. And so part of what we consider to be our accomplishment is to say, OK, here's the actual mathematics underlying these ideas. If you translate this into mathematics, then it starts making sense, at least to mathematicians. Um, and so that's part of what I want to communicate, is that there were things that people did not understand. These polynomial chains in particular, you know, what exactly was going on. You can follow it line by line and check that things worked, but why, you know, what was really happening wasn't so clear. And it's not necessarily useful to actually go into those details. So I think I, and I don't have time. Um, okay, so in terms of what we did that was different, so we did a lot of things that were the same, but converting things to a mathematical formulation. Um, one thing that we did that allowed us to go further and do some things a bit better were they were using ideal lattices. And ideal lattices are lattices, and they're also ideals in rings. Um, and so they were, and they were using the structure as an ideal. And what we said was, you don't need to actually use that. Just use the module structure. You can throw away. So what's a, an ideal? An ideal is a module along with an embedding of the module into the ring. And we said, throw away the embedding into the ring. What's the advantage of doing that? Well, when you multiply ideals together, you can write things with respect to any z basis, but the coefficients with respect to that basis are going to grow very quickly. You have coefficient blow up um, because of the way the ideals are embedded in the ring. What we do instead is we forget about that embedding into the ring. We're tensoring abstract modules, and we can avoid keeping track of these embeddings, and we can avoid the large coefficients and avoid um, some of the coefficient blow up in that way. So that was one thing um, so that by saying, forget that these are ideals, just use that they're modules, we were able to gain something from that. I'm um, going back to these polynomial chains and that step two that you asked about. 
Um, so these are the polynomial chains. So there are these, um, and I think here maybe the V that you started with was V0, and they slowly build up these polynomial chains, and they're getting more and more information until they get enough information that they can compute V to the P minus 1 and so on. Um, the hint thing, like Using the hint, yeah. They start with VV bar, they use the hint, they compute these polynomial chains sort of at the same, there's two chains that they're computing step by step at the same time, one feeding into the other, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. And it's complicated and it's not, there's never ever quite clear to people why that worked. What we're doing instead is something that at least mathematically seems more natural, which is, so here L is your ideal lattice. And we take L, and we take L tensor with itself, so L tensor L. This L uh, tensor 3 means L tensor L tensor L, and so on. And we also take something that I'll maybe define later, L to the 0, and then we have an L bar, which you want to think of as an inverse lattice, um, and an L bar uh, tensor with itself, and so on. We get this graded tensor algebra. So here we have a grading. We have the 0th piece, the first piece, second, third, and minus 1, minus 2 and so on. And we claim that if you do all your arithmetic inside that, you can do a nice, um, mathematically nice algorithm um, that accomplishes what Gentry and Zidlow were trying to accomplish and also allows you to maybe do some other things. Um, so where they were using these auxiliary large primes P and P prime, we end up using some auxiliary large prime powers. And what that gains us is we can then apply a certain analytic number theory result that I'll tell you about in a couple of minutes. I should also say that I was told um, that I'm allowed to do more than half an hour because there were people who were saying, you can't possibly tell us anything in half an hour. So um, I'm assuming I should warn you, if you need to leave, you, you can leave in the middle of the talk. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit later about how, um, about the analytic number theory result, I'll just state it. Um, but what that allows us to do is they had a heuristic um, runtime that was based on some heuristic assumptions. And what we end up with is a, a, both a more efficient algorithm and something that's provably deterministic polynomial time. Okay, um, so we said, so we saw lattices earlier in this workshop, and people said, oh, okay, a lattice is something contained in R to the n. Now, for us, a lattice is defined differently, so it's not necessarily something contained in R to the n. For us, a lattice is going to be a finitely generated abelian group along with an inner product. So by inner product, I mean a map from L cross L to the integers, where L is your finitely generated abelian group, L is your lattice, um, that is bilinear, symmetric, and positive definite. And I'm going to take that as a definition of the lattice. Um, so the standard lattice um, is going to be just z to the n with the inner product just being the usual dot product. So that's something very familiar. And having an orthonormal basis is the same as being isomorphic to the standard lattice of the same rank. So um, remember I said at the beginning that what we're doing is if under certain additional extra structure um, we answer the question, we decide whether something has a, a lattice has an orthonormal basis, and if so, we find it. Um, so I said isomorphic to the standard lattice. What do I mean by isomorphic? An isomorphism of lattices is just a group isomorphism. So if L and M are your lattices, it's a group isomorphism, say from L to M, that respects the lattice structures. So when I say respect the lattice structures, I just mean that it respects the inner products on the two lattices. And an automorphism is an isomorphism from the lattice onto itself. Okay, so what we then introduced were what we call G lattices, and these are the lattices with symmetry. So when I say lattices with symmetry, I'm going to mean G lattice. So how do we want to define a G lattice? We're going to take, we're going to fix throughout the rest of the talk a finite abelian group G with an element of order 2, and let's call that distinguished element U. Um, a G lattice is going to be a lattice with a G action where u is acting like minus 1. So another way to say a g action with u acting like minus 1 is that we have a lattice along, a lattice, let's say, L, along with a group homomorphism from g to the set of automorphisms of L, where the element u in the group goes to the automorphism minus 1, so it takes anything in the lattice and sends it to the uh, additive inverse. 
Um, if I have two G lattices, L and M, I'm going to say that they are G isomorphic. If you have an isomorphism between them as lattices that not only respects the lattice structure but also respects the G action. So that means if you take um, an X over here, um, if you take sigma of X where sigma is in the group, then the image of sigma of X is sigma of the image of X. That's what this says. So just a natural um, respecting of the G action. So that's what we mean by a G isomorphism. Uh, and these are our lattices with symmetry. Okay, so let's take an example. An example is what I'm going to be calling the standard G lattice, and I might occasionally call it the modified group ring. So what is that? And I'll also give some more concrete examples of this um, in, a, in a second. Um, so the, a standard thing in mathematics is the group ring. So G is my group. Um, Z square brackets G just means take the formal sums where the sigmas are running over the elements of the group and the coefficients are integers. So that's what this group ring is. So this is known as the group ring. And what we're going to do is, so um, in that I have U plus 1, where 1 I just mean the identity element in the group. So I want to mod out by the ideal generated by u plus 1. In other words, take this group ring and we're going to identify u with minus 1. Remember we said u was acting like minus 1 anyway, so that's what we want to do. So this is our um, modified group ring, and this is going to be a standard G lattice. So why is it a G lattice? Well, the G action is clear. You just take anything in here. You can multiply by an element of the group. You still get something in here. So the G action is clear. Um, the lattice structure is something we're going to have to impose, is something we're going to have to define. So that just means we want to define an inner product. I'm going to define the inner product as follows. So it's going to be T of something, where T takes something in the group ring, and it sends it to the coefficient of the identity element minus the coefficient of u. So that's what t does. And it's going to be t of x, y bar, where bar means whenever you see an element of the group, you replace it by its inverse in the group. And it turns out that this um, gives you, this turns this uh, ring into a G lattice using the definition on the other slide. So you can all check this if you, if you wanted to. It's all just uh, straightforward. Um, verification. So this is what we'll call the standard G lattice, and in maybe the next slide I'll give you some examples. But let me point out that, first of all, it is a, um, a G lattice of rank n, where um, 2n is the order of the group. So remember, we have a group with an element of order 2, so we know that group has to have even order. Call that order 2n, and let's define n. That, that defines a number n, an integer n. Um, this then turns out to be a G lattice of rank n. As lattices, it's just the standard lattice, z to the n. But it has this additional um, g action. Uh, and it turns out that as a ring, it's an integral domain if and only if g is cyclic and n is a power of 2. So we're seeing these two power things coming up again, as you've been seeing in cryptography. And there are reasons maybe for that. OK, so here are the examples. So if I take particular groups G, I can see what this standard G lattice is in those examples. And then you can see that we're recovering some of the rings that we're interested in for cryptography. OK, so let's start by G being, so we have this U as an element of order 2. Take the subgroup generated by U. Um, take the direct, sum, direct product of that with a cyclic group of order N. Then it turns out that this. Um, standard G lattice, this modified group ring, is just the group ring where the group is now the cyclic group of order n. And that, um, you, so you take a generator of here and map it to x, and you get an isomorphism to z square bracket x modulo x to the n minus 1. So in that case, it's just z square bracket x minus x to the n minus 1. These isomorphisms are both isomorphisms both as rings and as lattices. Um, in particular, if G is cyclic, then this uh, standard G lattice is z square bracket x mod x to the n plus 1. And if G is cyclic of order 2 to the n, then we just recover the ring of integers in the cyclotomic field generated by a primitive 2 to the rth root of unity. So here we're, re we're recovering some of the cyclotomic um, rings that we're interested in for cryptography. And also recovering the situation considered by Gentry and Zidlow. OK, so what's our main algorithm? Now I can give you an explicit, correct statement of what we prove or what our main theorem is. 
what we do is give a deterministic polynomial time algorithm that decides whether a G lattice is G isomorphic to the standard G lattice. And if it is, it exhibits such an isomorphism. So why does that answer the question that I stated in, in one of my earliest slides, which was about um, finding an orthonormal basis? Well, if I take the standard G lattice, um, Z brackets G, um, the way you can get, so we said that was a rank N lattice. If you take half the group elements, namely you take a set of coset representatives for G modulo the subgroup generated by U that gives you N elements, um, those will give you an orthonormal basis. So this always has an orthonormal basis and, it's, and you get it from half the group elements. And so it follows from this that this algorithm decides whether a G lattice has an orthonormal basis and it finds one if it does. So it takes a lattice with symmetry and it determines whether it has an orthonormal basis and if it does, it finds one. Okay, so if one question is how do we recover the gentry zidlow algorithm from, from this algorithm? What does it have to do with gentry zidlow So let me explain that next. I think I can do that on two slides. Um, I usually do it on one, but I decided to, to, to be nice and do it on two slides. Um, okay, suppose that I is an ideal in Z brackets G, or if you prefer, you can be more general and take it to be a fractional ideal. And you can take W either to be in your, your group ring, in your uh, uh, modified group ring Z brackets G, or more generally, you can take the coefficients to be rational numbers if you like. You can take it um, to be in here. So if I is your ideal, um, suppose that ii bar is contained in z brackets g times w. And suppose that w is totally positive. So what do I mean by totally positive? I mean that um, for every ring homomorphism into the complex numbers, w actually gets mapped to a positive real number. So it's natural definition of what it means to be totally positive. For every embedding into the complex numbers, w actually goes to a positive real number. So it's a totally positive element. Um, if you're in that setting, then it turns out that I is a G lattice. Well, the G action is clear because it's an ideal in, um, in Z brackets G or Q brackets G. So it's just, the G action is just multiplication by elements of the group. The lattice structure you have to be a bit more careful with. The lattice structure we're going to define in this way, we remember T was what we had before. We had T of X, Y bar was defining our inner product on Z brackets G. On this ideal, and I deal with this property, um, what we want to do is to find the lattice structure by T of X, Y bar over W. And it turns out that will make this into a G lattice. And it will be a useful G lattice in terms of recovering the gentry zidlow algorithm. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So we're going to denote that G lattice as L, I, comma, W. So the set is just I, but the structure, the lattice structure is given by this, complicate, by this inner product. Um, for example, if you just want a particular example, take your ideal I to be Z brackets G, take W to be 1. Um, and then this is just, you're just recovering the standard um, G lattice. So that's an example of this. OK, so how do we recover the gentry zidlow algorithm? So remember, what did the gentry zidlow algorithm do? It started with this ring, Z square bracket X minus XN minus 1, where N was an odd prime. And you're inputting um, a Z basis for an ideal that you're promised is principal. And you're given VV bar, and you want to recover V. So what do we do? So we want to apply our algorithm to solve this problem. We let G be a cyclic group of order 2N, where N is, is this N. So then we said on an earlier slide, the standard um, G lattice is then Z square brackets X minus X to the N minus 1, which is the ring that we care about in the gentry Zidlow problem. Um, our algorithm then produces, um, so what does it do? It checks whether there's a, um, a G isomorphism from this lattice, between this lattice and the standard G lattice. That's what our algorithm is doing. And in this case, because we have this principal ideal, um, it will produce your G isomorphism. So it's producing a G isomorphism from this lattice to this one, this being just the ideal I, and it does it in polynomial time. Um, if we take the image of 1 under this map, what we recover is a generator V of the ideal. So that's how you recover the gentry zidlow algorithm from the algorithm that I stated, the, the, from the theorem that I stated saying that there exists an algorithm that does a certain thing. Um, 
So briefly, in terms of what we do, a little bit differently. Um, so I said that Gentry and Zidlow look at auxiliary primes, P and P prime, large primes, with this property. What we replace that with is we let k be the exponent of the group G. So the exponent is the smallest positive integer k, such that sigma to the k equals 1 for every sigma in the group. So it divides the order of the group, and it has the same prime factors as the order of the group. And we let k of m for any positive integer m be the exponent of, well, take um, z brackets g, mod out by the ideal generated by m, and take the unit group of that. And what we do is we replace their large primes by auxiliary prime powers L and M, such that the GCD of these um, two exponents, K of L and K of M, is equal to K, the exponent of G. So it's, that looks very much the same as what they did, except that for some reason we're doing things a little bit differently. And the reason is um, that their finding of those primes, those large primes P and P prime, required a heuristic argument. And we can find our prime powers with a provably deterministic polynomial time algorithm by using a certain theorem in analytic number theory, which maybe I won't. I'll just skip over um, and, if, and reference the paper if anybody wants to see it. Um, but this is what allows us to give us something provably deterministic um, when theirs was not. Um, so there's some nice number theory involved there. And also, they had um, certain requirements that, certain, that the things they were dealing with not be zero divisors, modular various primes, and we have no such condition in our case. Um, another thing that we introduced that turns out to be important is the concept of being invertible. So we're dealing with invertible G lattices. Invertible means it has an inverse. So here, the inverse, um, what you want to do is in the realm of G lattices, you want to think of your identity element as being the standard G lattice. So this is your identity element. Um, your operation is you're tensoring um, your G lattices, where you're tensoring over this, uh, this, this lattice. Um, so being invertible means it has an inverse. So L being invertible is going to mean that L is a unimodular lattice. And there's a Z brackets G module M, such that L tensor M tensoring over over this uh, is um, isomorphic to z brackets g as z brackets g module. So you want to think of m as the inverse of l. So l times m is the identity element, so m is the inverse of l. That's the way this should be thought about. Um, so in particular, the standard g lattice is invertible by just taking m to be the standard g lattice. It's its own inverse. It's the identity element. It's invertible. Um, so the major, one of the major steps of our proof is to show that a G lattice, so we care whether it's G isomorphic to the standard G lattice. Turns out it's G isomorphic to the standard G lattice if and only if it's invertible and has a vector of length 1. Um, and in fact, if you have, if you look at the set of G isomorphisms that we're interested in, so G isomorphisms from the standard G lattice to the one you care about, if L is invertible, then um, if you take such an isomorphism, you can look at f of 1. It's going to be a vector here. Since 1 has length 1 over here, its image has length 1 over here, so you're mapping to the set of vectors of length 1. And this map that takes your isomorphism f and sends it to f of 1, this is going to be a bijection. So the set of G isomorphisms is in bijection with the vectors of length 1 if you start with an invertible G lattice. Um, and if you have a vector of length 1, um, then the set of vectors of length 1 is just um, apply sigma to your given vector. So you end up with exactly, well, so the vectors of length 1, you either have none of them or you have 2n of them. And if you want to determine whether or not you have such a G isomorphism, well, what you want to do according to this theorem is you want to first check and see if it's invertible. And if it's invertible, you want to find a vector of length 1. And if you can find a vector of length 1, then you know how to find your G isomorphism. You just go back via this bijection. OK, so let me just very, very briefly sketch the algorithm. I'm almost done. So first step, check whether. So we, want, we said there is a G isomorphism if and only if the lattice is um, invertible and has a vector of length 1. So you first check and see if it's invertible. We have an algorithm for doing that. You then use this analytic number theory result to give a polynomial time algorithm to produce um, large prime powers, in fact, greater than 2 to the n over 2, such that this GCD is k. Um, you then compute an element of the lattice that generates capital L modulo um, little m times little l times m. 
um, as a module over this. For that, we actually use some commutative algebra to produce a general algorithm that decides if a finite module over a finite commutative ring is cyclic, and if it is, it produces a generator. And then we apply that here. Um, What's the complexity? Uh, well, again, it's polynomial. I mean, these are all polynomial time algorithms, but I guess I'd have to but see the paper. So would solve the problem of finding a generator in a in an ideal lattice. Um, well, here I'm looking at finite. So these are finite modules over finite rings, and that's crucial. So, and so. how does the complexity depends on the size of this? Uh, I, I, we would have to okay. yeah, talk, let's talk about that offline. I think I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, but yeah, we, we have a paper that uh, that's, uh, that's online and that we can have a look at. For that. Um, okay, so we have this generator for this uh, for this finite um, module. Um, we then use that. So this 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 thing, this generator. What we do is we tensor it with itself k of m times. We then look at this coset. So we're looking at, at this thing modulo m. And so we get a coset there, this namely this, this element of that, which is this coset. And it turns out this has, these have been chosen large enough that you can actually use LLL to solve a closest vector problem in this coset. And what that gives you is a vector of length 1 in here if one exists. So it tells you whether or not you have one, and if it um, does, it actually produces one. Um, once you have this vector of length 1 in here, then you want to use this, that this GCD is k to bring this down, bring this k of m down to k. So k of m is large, you want to bring it down to k, which is small and manageable. So you do that. Um, the next step, find a vector of length 1 in L tensor with itself k times. You use the Euclidean algorithm to get from k of m to k. And you again use LLL to solve a closest vector problem in a certain coset that I don't have time to define for you, where rather than looking at, at the things modulo m, you're now looking at things modulo little l. Um, then you want to basically extract a kth root of that vector. So you want to find a vector of length 1 in L if 1 exists. Um, so this is analogous to finding the, I guess, the 2 nth root that Gentry and Zidler were doing. And what we use there is quite a lot of commutative algebra to give an algorithm that finds generators for the roots of unity of any order. And we use this to extract a kth root um, of our short vector that we got in the previous step. Once you have a vector of length 1, then the desired isomorphism is you take anything in here and you multiply it by that vector of length 1, and that gives you your isomorphism. <coughs> Let's see, and I should also add that, in addition, we don't just um, determine an algorithm to decide whether something is isomorphic to the standard G lattice. We use that then to then, um, it's just an easy step from that to um, get an algorithm to decide whether two invertible G lattices are G isomorphic, and if so, it computes such an isomorphism, such a G isomorphism. Um, so one thing I should add um, is that these algorithms are not known to weaken the security of ring LWE. So we don't, we're not claiming that we can break that, but we are saying that if you have structure, and as Chris said in the previous talk, if you have structure, it's probably exploitable. Ex exploitable structure is abound. Um, so maybe I'll just add some work in progress. We have some other applications of some of, so we ended up with this very nice commuter of algebra that we used as subroutines in our algorithm. And these uh, commuter of algebra results actually have other applications, including to pointing out settings where you wouldn't want to base something on the discrete log problem being hard, because it turns out it's easy. So no settings in which anybody's actually using them at the moment, but settings where people might want to be careful in the future if they're thinking about using them. And we also have generalizations that, that will encompass more lattices that are potentially of cryptographic interest, including um, things associated with rings of integers and arbitrary CM fields or totally real fields um, and their products. So I think, uh, and so these are some of the references. So the early stuff that I mentioned is in a preprint that isn't public and may never be public, but the other things are all either, I guess everything else is public except for the one that's in preparation. Um, so maybe I will give thanks to the sponsors and remind you of the ad and take any questions. <laughs> Mathematics. As far as I know, the original Gentry Sidlow algorithm was never actually implemented. Uh, have you gone so far as to implement this? 
Uh, we have not. Um, and I don't know if other people have. I think, yeah, I don't know. And also, there are a lot of opti optimizations that we know can be done to this that we haven't done, but that we're hoping other people will if anybody wants to implement it. Questions? Thank you again.